Hello and welcome to another installment of TV30, a production of the Government Information Service. My name is Jessie Léonce, Information Assistant at the Department of Sustainable Development. And boy, do we have some exciting news for you. St. Lucia, through the Department of Sustainable Development, has been recognized by the United Nations alongside Pacific Islands, Comoros, and Vanuatu for a small islands developing state's restoration drive. And this collaboration was one of 10 winning initiatives from around the world dubbed World Restoration Flagships for their role in restoring the natural world. The announcement was made at the UN Biodiversity Conference, or COP15, in Montreal last month, delivered by actor and environmental activist Jason Mamoua himself. Uh, we had our permanent secretary, Mrs. Anita Mantout, accepting this award on behalf of St. Lucia, Comoros, and Vanuatu. Joining me to explain what this means for St. Lucia, as well as the overall outcome of this biodiversity COP, is my colleague Jeremiah Edmund, one of our Sustainable Development and Environment Officers, who was part of that delegation to the Biodiversity COP. Jeremiah, thank you so much for joining us, and also kudos uh, to the Biodiversity Team on this accomplishment. Um, good day, Jesse, and thanks for having me on the show today. Wonderful. First of all, for the benefit of our viewers, what is the Small Islands Developing States Restoration Drive, and in what ways will it benefit, um, the implementation of it benefit St. Lucians and St. Lucia? Okay, the Small Island Developing States Restoration Drive, it's an initiative that the UN is undertaking under the Decade of Restoration. In 2000, in 21, the UN launched the Decade of Restoration after about 70 countries put forward a proposal and it was approved in 2021. So these, this, uh, this, the SIDS Restoration Drive, it's actions taken in SIDS that show or demonstrate good practices of restoration and ecosystem management globally. I mean, we were selected from over 150 projects in over 50 countries globally. And what this would do is that it helped in ramping up our restoration efforts in St. Lucia and not just restoration, but also creating livelihoods and sustainably using the natural resources that we have here in St. Lucia. Okay, wonderful. So what I, I know there are individual objectives per project, but what is the overall objective of the world, re the, the SIDS restoration drive and the other nine world restoration flagships? What ground are, are we looking to cover overall in terms of restoration, conservation, and so on? Okay, so the overall goal is to restore about 68 million hectares globally, and it looks at a variety of different geographic areas as well as ecosystems and, 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 and land types. So you have seeds, you have some mountainous areas, you have a dry forest corridor in Central America, you have some work being done in the Maldives, no, in Dubai, sorry. Mm -hmm. You have also, so it's like different geographic areas, but it, covering, it covers 68 million hectares globally. And the intention is to restore these areas because most of them were identified as areas that have been severely degraded, so they're trying to restore them within this decade of restoration. Wonderful. Uh, COP15 ended with a, a landmark uh, biodiversity agreement. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, so at the end of COP15, one of the major items going into COP15 was the adoption of a post-2020 global biodiversity framework. So it was adopted at the end of COP15, and this framework, the it has four overall goals and 23 targets. But the, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the, 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 the vision for this framework is living in harmony with nature by 2050. So the, the goals go to 2050 and the targets are actionable targets set at 2030 to coincide with the SDGs. So this framework is very ambitious and it replaces the 2011 to 2020 strategic plan of action under the biodiversity for, for global biodiversity co conservation. So this 
was considered the Paris Agreement of biodiversity mm. in terms of the magnitude and, and the scale that they, they, they want to look at it. And they're looking at a whole of government and society approach where they want everybody involved, all sectors, all industries involved to, to ensure that by 2030, biodiversity is put back on a path where it could restore itself. Okay, wonderful. So just as we're, we're saying COP15, COP15, for the benefit of our viewers, COP15 is, is shorthand essentially for the 15th meeting of the Conference of the Parties to the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. Yeah? yeah. So the global biodiversity framework that you mentioned, Jeremiah, it aims to address biodiversity loss restore ecosystems and protect indigenous rights. Now, as for our own national biodiversity strategy and action plan, we call it NBSAP, what are St. Lucia's priorities where these are concerned are, and how unique are they compared to other small island developing states? So our NBSAP, the, the priorities that we have would be conservation and sustainable use and sharing benefits for our local communities. Well, we don't really have indigenous people, so our local communities and mm -hmm. the users of our natural re resources. So our NBSAP is not that unique from other SIDS because we face similar challenges and the your NBSAP in its, its intention is to reflect the, pro, the progress of your efforts to conservation and that would feed into a global system mm -hmm. so you would actually see your contribution would add up to the global targets. So in our case, our NBSAP was done and the goals and targets were based on the IACHI targets which were with the 2011 to 2020 strategic plan of action. Mm -hmm. So Coming out of COP, countries now have to align their NBSAPs with this new GBF. So it's most NBSAPs, they may have specific items, but in general, most of them would look at the same thing. Like for, like for cities, you would want to look at things like maybe alien invasive species, um, ecosystem management, sustainable use and, and, and access and benefit sharing for your resources and these kind of things. So it's not that unique because we face similar challenges like I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And um, just to segue a bit from, from, I know we're speaking NBSAP, but access and benefit sharing, that is something that features prominently in um, the, the whole negotiation process uh, for uh, COP15. Can you tell us a little bit about where that is at right now in terms of um, countries around the world being able to share their, in, their information about biodiversity, um, to be able to uh, tap into it for um, economic purposes and so on? Okay, so in terms of, of sharing information, um, the convention, the CBD, they, there's a clearinghouse mechanism where countries would upload information. So your national reports and things of, of that sort, they, they upload on that platform. Um, in terms of benefits and, and sharing benefits for use of resources in one country by a, a outside party or a third party, um, the convention has a protocol which deals with this, um, the Nagoya protocol which deals specifically with access and benefit sharing. Um, globally, not all member, or not all parties to the convention are party to this access and benefit sh sharing protocol. But being party, what it allows you to do is that if someone comes in and they take your genetic resource mm -hmm. and they use it in a for any commercialization, for commercial process, then they are supposed to compensate the, 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 the source of that genetic resource so that they have to benefit from it. Now, St. Lucia is party to this protocol as well. So if someone comes in and they use our resource and we could trace it to that product, then there is, they have to compensate for using our resource because we are party to this, con this protocol. Okay. Um, coming back to the NBSAP, what is the status of St. Lucia's uh, strategy and action plan for um, biodiversity? 
Okay, so our MBSAB is up for review. It was from 2018 to 2025, so we halfway through. And with the new GBF, one of the outcomes of COP was that by the end of the year, parties should align the NBSAPs to this new framework, these new goals and targets, the global goals and targets. Now, um, the Jeff under the Jeff, the Global Environment Facility under the A cycle of funding, there's a, a program that they're running, an early action support program where they're providing countries with support, financial support, mm -hmm. to update the NBSAPs and align them with these global targets. Uh, St. Lucia has applied and the funding has been approved, so this should be coming on stream anytime soon. And it's a, it's, it's a, the project run for two years, so it, from 2023 to 2024, where mm -hmm. y there are four options. You could update your N a, a, a quick review on updating your targets. You could look at the monitoring framework for your NBSAP. You look at aligning policies, environmental policies with, your N with, your, with the GBF and your NBSAP. And the fourth one is developing a a finance plan for biodiversity in your country. So these four areas are what the funding would cover, but St. Lucia decided to focus on the first one, doing the review, the quick review and alignment of our goals and targets to the global biodiversity framework okay. and component three of aligning our policies. Yeah, so these were the two components that St. Lucia decided to focus on. To prioritize. Yeah. Okay, so going back to the, the, the wider picture, overall, how successful has the world been in reducing biodiversity loss since the convention um, was to, came into force in 1993? Um, biodiversity COP, COP15, overall has been dubbed the biggest biodiversity COP of, of, of the decade, in a, in a decade. Is it because we have marked a triumph or are we still navigating trials that where, where nature is concerned? Okay, let me start with the end part of your question. <laughs> um, yes, this has been hailed the biggest biodiversity COP in decades, and not because of triumphs, but because of the realization at the rate of which biodiversity loss has been accelerating. Mm. So a lot of effort is being put in to biodiversity conservation and sustainable use, but a lot of biodiversity is still being lost because in many cases, the drivers of biodiversity loss are not really addressed. So unless we could address these, these drivers, and sometimes a lot of the drivers are economic factors. So countries would look to develop, but in developing, you clear your forests, you, you change land uses. So there's a, there's a give and take. So if you develop, you lose biodiversity. If you lose by if you conserve, sometimes you don't develop as quick as you would want to. So we have not, I mean, in specific instances, you could see that sometimes you see a lot of work is done and you see restoration of a lot of areas and some species be, being brought back from close to extinction. Mm -hmm. But on a global scale, biodiversity has been, loss has been increasing year after year. Okay, and so how, su so how successful have we been in the work since 93? We have seen some gains, mm -hmm. a lot. And in some areas you see a lot of gains, in some areas, like for example, in the last strat strat strategic plan that the CBD developed, there were these IACHI goals and targets. There were 20 of them, but most of these were not fully achieved. In some, for some of them, you had very little progress and some you had more than others. So on a global scale, you may not see these big numbers, but on, on country levels in some areas, you see a lot of success on a smaller scale than you might see on a, at a, the global level when you aggregate all of it. Mm -hmm. It may not look as much globally, but in specific areas, we have had a lot of successes. Okay, wonderful. 
We are due for our first break. We are speaking on biodiversity COP15 and St. Lucia being recognized. Do stay tuned. When we come back, we speak more on uh, this important conference and where St. Lucia and the rest of the world goes forward in preserving, conserving nature. Stay with us. The world's climate is changing and that affects all of us. Storms are Intense, periods of intense drought and heavy rain stress farm animals and destroy our crops. Higher average ocean temperatures kill our coral reefs and change the migratory patterns of fish. St. Lucia contributes only 0.0015% of global greenhouse gas emissions, but is doing its part, along with countries around the world, to reduce the emissions that are warming our world and changing our climate. These efforts are called mitigation. But decades of emissions have already changed the climate, and the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere today will increase average global temperatures even more. We need to adapt, that is, do everything we can to prepare for and respond to the actual and expected negative effects of climate change. And everyone has a role to play. We need to protect our crops, build homes that withstand storms, and keep our drains and waterways free of garbage to help us recover or bounce back from climatic events. Learn more about the Government of St. Lucia's National Adaptation Plan and the steps you can take to protect yourself and your fellow St. Lucians. Thank you so much for staying tuned. This is TV30. I am Jessie Leon's Information Assistant at the Department of Sustainable Development with some wonderful news of St. Lucia being recognized. One of the winning submissions coming from St. Lucia in collaboration with Comoros and Vanuatu, that is Pacific Islands, uh, for their Small Islands Developing States Restoration Drive. And this is one of 10 winning initiatives from around the world, dubbed World Restoration Flagships, being recognized by the United Nations. Uh, towards this UN Biodiversity Conference, COP15, happening last month in Montreal. I'm speaking to Mr. Jeremiah Edmund, my colleague at the department, who uh, traveled uh, on mission to Montreal for COP15. And uh, at, at this point, I want to ask you, uh, Jeremiah, what was your experience for COP15? How did it differ from previous COPs? Um, and what did the environment look like in terms of negotiations and so on? COP15 was busy, <laughs> long days, long negotiation sessions. But in the end, the overall objective, which was adopting a framework, that was done. But there was, there, there was a lot of back and forth in, in, in fine tuning the text mm -hmm. of that document. Um, leading up to COP in December, there were like five other meetings to develop this, this, this GBF. And it was a long and, and, and tedious process. Um, even days before COP, there was a meeting, an a, a open-ended working group that mm -hmm. was mandated by the parties to, to, to develop the, this global biodiversity framework. So they had the fifth meeting. Mm. Um, the first meeting was in 2019, second in 2020, and the third one was part of, of which was done virtually in 2021. And in 2022, the third, second part of the third meeting was held in, in Switzerland. And negotiations were really going slow on developing the, the, the text. Parties were in, introducing a lot of new texts after things were already decided. They would come in and just bring in something new out of nowhere. So it, at times, it got really frustrating where items or text you thought that would at, at was already negotiated. Somebody would just come back with something totally different and just throw it off, and then you start back from, from scratch. From, mm -hmm. Yes, just from zero. But in, in, in the end, I mean, we have something that's fairly easy to read and, 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 and understand and satisfies or would get the objective that, 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 that the world would need. I mean, all parties were not happy with everything we got, but we got a workable document that could get us to our objective of living in harmony with nature by 2050. Okay, wonderful. 
um, I, I want to draw, uh, you know, and acknowledge the linkages between biodiversity and biosafety, which is your department and some of the other wood program areas within the Department of Sustainable Development. And no, we are not just all about climate change. There are other areas like uh, chemicals, uh, um, biodiversity, uh, we talk about the ozone um, protection and, and so on. And so nature is critical to meeting the sustainable development goals and limiting global warming, looking at climate change as well, global warming to 1.5 degrees. Biodiversity and climate change are linked in many ways, but they remain uh, separate at the policy level. So hence COP27 this year, people probably wondering what's all these COPs about? But COP27 was about climate change and uh, COP15 was about biodiversity. Uh, Jeremiah, what are some of the linkages that um, you can just draw now from, from the top of your head um, between climate change and biodiversity and how can they be tackled together? Any particular references made to that at COP15? Okay, so Let's start with the linkages. Mm -hmm. um, climate change is one of the biggest drivers of biodiversity loss globally. Mm -hmm. And to reduce or to keep our temperatures from not surpassing 1.5, biodiversity is required. So they interdepend they're interdependent. If mm -hmm. you have increases in temperature, you're going to lose biodiversity. If you conserve biodiversity, like you, you, rest, you, you restore more forests, you maintain more grasslands, you, you conserve your wetlands and you restore your wetlands, you could sequest much more carbon. So they're linked, but at a policy level, I don't know why a lot of people still try to look at them separately, mm -hmm. but what the convention are trying to do now, like the convention on climate change and on biodiversity, they, they, they're trying to create more linkages with the convention so that the work, they, they could combine the efforts to meet their objective. So for example, in the new framework, there's a target which specifically looks at reducing climate change and, and pollution. So target eight of the framework, it looks at climate change and pollution. So they, they try to to fit it in there. there. There's another one, another target which, which looks at reducing harmful subsidies. Mm. So for industries that use biodiversity or affect biodiversity, try, tr trying to reduce harmful subsidies to biodiversity. So they try to put in, in actionable targets that would actually help climate change as well as help biodiversity. So the, the links are there and at a policy level, we need to look at them as, as tackling one, you tackle the other, and not as climate change by itself and biodiversity or, or, or by itself on the other hand. Mm -hmm. But by addressing climate change, you will be addressing biodiversity, but you need to put that in writing, in policy, that, so that it's not just assumed. And it's re reinforced. Yeah. Um, a, a, another. Um, point I, I wanted to bring up. I recall um, our World Wetlands Day panel discussion last year, and it, it, it brought to the fore much controversy here in St. Lucia in terms of the way um, our biodiversity, our, our locations, our cons conservation sites and what have you um, are being protected. Um, can you speak to the, the significance of political will, I dare say, um, as we're entering this, this new framework, this post-2020 global biodiversity framework, the political will that we will be required for the protection, conservation, and ensuring the sustainable use of our spaces here, particularly on island. This GBF is extremely ambitious, so we would need the political will to match, the financial resources, the capacities, as well be it human capacity. Um, for this GBF to work, world leaders have to put or create the enabling environments for the, to achieve these goals uh, and, and targets. So that will must be there. Mm -hmm. And if we do not have the, that political will, you will not, you, you won't get close to, to uh, achieving some of these targets. Because, for example, you have one target which speaks of 
conserving or, or, or protecting 30% of your sea and 30% of your land. That is a huge political commitment that you have to make as a country to conserve 30% of your landmass or 40% of your, of your ocean. And we know sometimes you have competing interests for land and for your sea spaces. So that will, for that conservation, it must be seen as not just conserving for conserving sake, but you could conserve and still develop in a sustainable manner and use your conservation measures to generate income for your country. So the policymakers need to understand that conservation is not just about locking it away, but you conserve and you sustainably use so that you could derive the benefits of your conservation. Because there's no point in conserving a million hectares and it's just there, no, no one can use it, no one can access it. What you want is for conserving it so that your people could access it and benefit from it. Okay, wonderful. We are wrapping up now and, and with the inroads made at COP15, finally we have lodged a document that can be worked with, as you mentioned. Um, what are we working towards for COP16? What can we look forward to for uh, this year's COP? Well, COP16 will be next year, 2024, okay, every, right. every two years. But looking towards COP16, firstly, c parties or countries need to update and, uh, and align their national biodiversity, biodiversity strategic action plans to this new framework. So that's, that's the first thing that you need to do because you need to align them so that you could reach the global goals and targets. First. Secondly, we, there, are, there, there are still some things that need to be ironed out like the monitoring framework for this the monitoring framework for the GBF. Mm -hmm. How will it be monitored and the financing of it? So it has not been established yet. Well, the monitoring framework node, it has not, it, the mandate was given to the CB, the, the convention to get a framework, to a monitoring framework for it by COP 2016. Okay. But there's a resource mobilization plan, there's a, a capacity building plan to, to help countries reach these goals and targets by 2030. I mean, we don't have much time. It's like eight years to achieve all, 20 tar all 23 targets. So mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of, of finance, a lot of capacity, a lot of political will, and a lot of collaboration from different sectors because it looks at a whole of government approach, a whole of society approach to for it for this to be achieved everybody has to be on board so we and you need a lot of awareness public awareness and education critical for the success of this gbf wonderful thank you very much jeremiah edmund sustainable development and environment officer at the department of sustainable development so overseeing biodiversity and biosafety and coming off of your trip to montreal for the uh, 15th meeting of the conference of the parties to the u.n convention on biodiversity thank you very much for speaking to us on the outcomes of that thank you so much Thank you, Jesse. It was my pleasure. Wonderful. Thank you. And we cannot forget that St. Lucia has been selected out of many countries, many submissions to be part, uh, to be a recipient under the World Restoration flagship. Uh, we will be posting on our social media. You could go on to our Facebook page, uh, the Department of Sustainable Development St. Lucia, as well as our Instagram, uh, Department of Sustainable Development St. Lucia as well, uh, to get more information on what this uh, award means, uh, Small Island Developing States Restoration Drive, what it means for St. Lucia, how we can benefit, particularly the Southeast Coast. So that information will be um, flowing out to the general public in the coming weeks and months. My name is Jesse Leons for the Department of Sustainable Development and the Government Information service. I'd like to thank you so much for watching. Do stay tuned for more NTN programming. Goodbye.